Okay, guys, uh, today is 2 4 21. Today's Thursday. Um, so if you haven't gotten my message, if you hadn't gotten the uh announcement or the email, there will be I won't be here tomorrow. And since I won't be here and we had a lot of questions, I'm just gonna go ahead and push this test till Monday, but know that we are going to have to um catch ourselves back up. We won't be able to be a day behind for the rest of the term. Okay. So Monday, the same times, Alpha Team come here at one o'clock. You'll do your test and your lab. So now you have the weekend to study up on your test, study up on the lab of how to change those cylinder regulators out. Um, today I'm going to knock out a little, the, the rest of the, the lecture, go ahead and knock that out and put it in there for you to study tonight uh, and over the weekend, okay? And so uh, the tests don't just focus on duration of flow, uh, little calculations like that. You need to really be honing in on the gas physics. That's the meat and potatoes of this. What are the qualities of oxygen? Um, um, how do we determine how long it lasts, right? Or what are the laws that we learned about gas? What is Charles's law talking about? Make sure you understand Boyle's law and Gay-Lussac's law. You need to have some ideas in your mind for some examples of those laws so you can understand them. Also, Dalton's law, when he talks about the adding of all of the pressures in the atmosphere come together to make one barometric pressure, all right? Albergadro talks about a mole. It says one gram of any substance has so, uh, six times 10 to the 23 um, uh, atoms, right? Stuff like that. Uh, but that's considered a mole. So Avogadro talks about the mole, okay? Today you're gonna learn about the weight, atomic weight of oxygen and stuff like that. So make sure that is the main crust of the test, knowing the gas physics. And then the cylinders and oxygen safety systems for this regulator, that regulator, uh, what's compensated Thorpe tube or not, all right? We're gonna talk about the flow meter. We talked about uh, regulators a little bit yesterday, but we're gonna go in depth of the regulator and the flow meter today and what that entails, okay? How to tell if that flow meter is either compensated or not compensated. So those are the things you wanna, I'm gonna put up here today. It's gonna to be a really long lecture since nobody's gonna be here. I'm just gonna go straight through it. You have an assignment for tonight that's due for, you know, today. You have an assignment for tomorrow, okay? That workbook is to be done amongst all of this, but tomorrow, instead of logging in, you will log in to your discussion, okay? It would not be available until tomorrow, okay? So you won't be able to do your discussion, your Friday's assignment, as far as the discussion is concerned, the class assignment, which is a discussion about cylinders. You won't be able to open that until tomorrow. So don't try to get into it tonight and all that, because I can't keep up with well, you did both of your assignments on this day. We're not doing that because that's for your attendance, okay? It's your assignment for that day so I can count you for attendance, all right? I still have a couple of people that are not turning in their homework uh, and you're getting absences for it, okay? Uh, now, um, so the homework assignments are, and the assi attendance assignments are in there. The daily assignments are in the module as we speak. And some of them are open now and then, and then, and then a couple of them won't be open till tomorrow. I think the, uh, the discussion itself won't be open till tomorrow to make sure you do it on tomorrow, okay? Now, let's share my screen so we can get in with the rest of the lecture. I'm going to back up on it just a little bit since I'm just going to be talking straight through it, um, just to make sure you got all of the notes you want or from your note taking guide. We talked about safety systems for cylinders. We talked about the E cylinders. Those are the ones that you see Mr. Johnson with at the casino, right? The E cylinders. Uh, have a color coding system. Now the larger ones don't necessarily have them. Sometimes they do, but it's not mandatory for large cylinders, okay? But the E-tanks or E-cylinders must be color coded. But that's not the only safety system because if you're colorblind, it doesn't work for you, okay? So oxygen is green in America, but everywhere else it's white. Carbon dioxide is gray, nitrous oxide is blue, cyclopropane is orange, helium is brown, ethylene is red, 
air is yellow, that's room air, okay? It's called medical gas or medical air. That's just straight up room air, okay? Uh, nitrogen is black, all right? That's the color coding safety system. Then we have the pin index safety system, right? Pin index safety system. And that is uh, for the little pissant tanks. If you want to say that, P-I-S-S, -S, pin index safety system is for the E-cylinder and smaller, okay? How that works is what I showed you yesterday. We have um, higher pressures greater than 200 PSI, right? And it breaks it down, okay? So those pressures will uh, be broken down to a standard working pressure of 50 PSI. But in order to do that and to guarantee that you don't put the wrong regulator on the wrong cylinder, and in this case, E cylinders and smaller, they use the pin index safety system. So an E cylinder already has two, color coding and pin index safety system, right? All right, so the pin index safety system I showed you in the PowerPoint, you can look in the PowerPoint, it has pin positions, all right? Uh, it's got like one through seven, but oxygen happens to be position two and five, okay? So that regulator will have position two and five on it, and the actual E cylinder is positioned at two and five. That makes me be able to put on a oxygen regulator onto an E cylinder without a problem. Because I don't want to put an oxygen, uh, if I'm colorblind, and I put a oxygen regulator on a nitrous tank, right? Because I can't see that it's blue. Or what if I put it on an ethylene tank? I don't want somebody to be breathing in ethylene, right? Or cyclopropane. They will kill them, okay? So color is not uh, what you need to have. you got to have more than that. Because if I'm colorblind, then say I'm colorblind, and I pick up a carbon dioxide e-cylinder. Okay, and I have a regulator that doesn't have the pin index safety system. If that's not a system, then what could happen? If I don't have the pin index safety system, then I might just be willy nilly just putting on a oxygen regulator onto a carbon dioxide tank, put it in my, it would fit with no problem. Right? And that would be a problem because then I will be increasing my carbon dioxide with every breath. And so what would that lead to? What would me breathing in nothing but carbon dioxide lead to in my body? Right? And I want something deeper. Think about it deeper than just acidosis. Of course, we know carbon dioxide is acid. Yes, I'm going to go into a respiratory acidosis, probably die sooner or later. But why will I die? That's the thing. What is happening in my body because of the constant CO2, right? So we'll come back to that. Now, so the pin index safety system is made so that I don't put the wrong regulator on the wrong E tank, okay? Position for oxygen is two and five. There's an air flow meter that goes, I mean, an air regulator that goes on the air tanks, which is uh, at one and five. The positions on that will be only at one and five, so they will only fit on a medical air cylinder, okay? And then the CO2 one that I was talking about earlier, it only fits to the CO2 regulator with its position one and six, okay? So I couldn't put a one and six on a two and five oxygen. It won't work, it won't fit, okay? So those are two safety systems that help me not put the wrong gas into the, uh, the wrong patient's body, okay? All right. The American Standard Safety System, that is the next uh, safety system, and that's for our larger tanks. That's for the larger than E cylinders, like our H cylinder, our G cylinder, right? Those use the nipple and threaded nut. Showed you yesterday in the video about the nipple and the threaded nut and how it goes right up on there, screw it in, right? And you're good to go. Uh, that is the nipple and threaded nut, okay? It had, deals with high pressure. Uh, and it's for cylinders larger than E. So we call those the big ASS tanks, right? The big ass tanks. That's the American Standard Safety System, all right? Then we have the diameter index safety system is the last one, which deals with all of the connections beyond the regulator, okay? So the regulator has a little place to screw my uh, nasal cannula to or my 
um, non-rebreather, my partial rebreather, my simple low to mask, or if it's a, a threaded nut, then I can screw in my um, uh, threaded connection. I can uh, screw in my water bottle or my aerosol face mask, aerosol tea piece, right? All of those connections after the regulator are governed by the DISS, okay? Then we got into the qualities of cylinder gases. We talked about the qualities of them all. We have some that are flammable, some are non-flammable, and some that support what? Combustion, right? Those are the qualities of gases as a whole. Flammable, which is ethylene and cyclopropane. Those are our flammable gases. Then we have our non-flammable gases, which are nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and helium. They're non-flammable. And then we have gases that support combustion. The first one off the rip is oxygen. Oxygen is not flammable, but it does support combustion. We used the example yesterday. If you have a candle and you put a lid over the candle, right? Then um, once we do that, what happens to the flame? If we put a cup over a candle that seals the oxygen out, the flame will die out because the flame has to have oxygen in order to breathe. It has to have it to burn and combust. And so oxygen, once you put the, the top on it or the cup on top, it will eat up the rest of the oxygen that's in that cup. And once the oxygen is gone, it goes out. But if you catch it right before it goes out and lift the cup up, it'll come back, okay? You have to catch it just right because once, once the combustion is gone, then it's over, okay? Once the flame goes out, it's over, okay? So that is why it supports combustion. Now. Not only oxygen, but nitrous oxide also supports combustion. Nitrous oxide supports combustion, okay? Now, what about the mixtures? Anything that has oxygen in it will be a supporter of combustion, okay? Anything that has oxygen in it will be a, a supporter of combustion. So helium is not a supporter. It's not flammable, it doesn't support combustion, but if I have a mixture of oxygen and helium, now it does support combustion. And that's called heliox. A lot of times we will use heliox in the smaller, I mean, the larger airways to overcome obstructions. Just think if you have a large tumor in your left main, bron main stem bronchus, right? And it's occluding some of the air and the oxygen can't go through it or around it. Well, we use a little heliox because what happens when you put helium in a balloon? It floats, right? It rises above because it is less dense than oxygen. Helium is less dense than oxygen. Therefore, it rises up over certain obstructions in the larger airways. Okay, so if I have a larger airway that has an obstruction there or some kind of push something pushing over it, uh, and it's compressing that bronchus a bit, then if we give a heliox mixture, that heliox will lift that oxygen up over the obstruction to get down into the parenchyma where we're trying to go, right? And so that is why we use a heliox mixture. Once we mix it with oxygen, it is now supporting combustion, all right? Carbogen, which is oxygen and carbon dioxide mixture. Uh, oxygen and nitrogen mixture. Oxygen nitrous oxide mixture, okay? Uh, those are all support combustion because oxygen or nitrous oxide has been added, okay? Now, those are the qualities of just gases, right? All of the gases. But let's look more specifically at the um, qualities of oxygen, right? We say oxygen, which we need to study. These are the things that that you need to understand about gas physics. Oxygen is colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless, and it has an atomic weight of 16 grams. The atomic weight of oxygen is 16 grams, and the molecular weight of oxygen is two times that, which is 32 grams. All right, somebody will miss that on the test. The atomic weight is 16 grams, but if they ask you what is the molecular weight of oxygen, then it is 32 grams, okay? Atomic weight is 16, molecular weight is 32 grams. Oxygen also has what's called a critical temperature. And this is when we are talking about uh, its natural state, which is at a liquid, 
okay? Oxygen at its natural state is a liquid, but because of temperatures, it rises above this critical temperature and turns into a gas, okay? So what is the critical temperature? Critical temperature is the temperature at which one temperature above will turn into gas. So as long as the critical temperature is negative 118.8 Celsius or negative 181.1 Fahrenheit, right? As long as it's that, then it will stay a liquid. And that says at 49.7 atmosphere. Ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> but that is the critical temperature, negative 118.8 Celsius or <clears throat> negative 181.1 Fahrenheit. If the temperature rises one degree above this, then that liquid will dissipate and turn into a gas. Okay? All right, and it also often uses fractional distillation. distillation. All right, we talked about the cylinder markings yesterday. We said on the front, we have these things, right? The DOT uh, has a recommended filling pressure of 2015. So if they say, what is the recommended filling pressure? 2015 PSI. But we said we're able to overfill by 10%, which would ultimately has a PSI of 2200 on a full cylinder, okay? On a full cylinder. It also has the serial number, ownership markings, and manufacturer's mark. And on the back, the back of the cylinder has the hydro, original hydrostatic testing. And we talked about hydrostatic testing being when they test um, the integrity of the cylinder, right? The cylinder is made up of one sheet of metal. It's not welded metal together or none of that. It is one flat sheet that um, a die press and pushes through and makes a mold, okay? And then they make it smaller and smaller to the head and then they put the, the uh, stem on it, all right? It's one sheet of metal. And so whenever that sheet of metal is compromised or uh, gets weak in one area because of the constant pressure that's being put in them when they're full, we do what's called a hydrostatic test. Right, every three, every five to 10 years, we do a hydrostatic test in which we put the cylinder in water and fill it to five thirds of its maximum pressure, right? And see if the water moves. If the water is displaced, you know how you put your foot in the water and the water rises, right? Well, or if you had your hand in the water and you move your finger, then the water will ripple. Well, what happens is we put the tank down in the water and they fill it up. If the water moves or just dis displaces a little, they can say, hmm, there's one part of this one sheet of metal that is weak. And what could happen if we put that out there? It could eventually become so weak that it could rupture on the side and your gas leak out or more, it could uh, implode, right? It could explode on you, not like a fire explode, but just bust and that becomes a missile, okay? So be very careful uh, when dealing with cylinders, but this is why we test it. And it should be every five to 10 years. And they will also put their inspection dates and it'll be on the back. When the last time you retest it, all right? Then it every time you look at a cylinder, the last test date on it should be no more than 10 years, okay? If you get a cylinder and you see that it hadn't been tested in 20 years, then you need to say something about that, okay? All right, filling and duration. We talked about this yesterday also. Uh, can be overfilled by 10%. Recommended filling pressure now is 2015, 2015 PSI. That's what the DOT re recommends, okay? But they allow you to overfill by 10%, which will equal 2200 PSI, and that's considered full, okay? The duration of flow, which is in minutes, is the tank pressure times the tank factor divided by the liter flow, okay? Tank pressure times tank factor divided by the liters per minute, right? Liter flow or LPM, which is LPM, which is liters per minute. The liters per minute guys are prescrip uh, prescribed by the physician or the respiratory therapist if they have a protocol, right? Whatever liters we put them on is how much oxygen they need. If I put them on two liters and their sat go up, then I leave them at two. 
But if I put them on two liters and it doesn't go up, then I need to give them a little bit more. Put them on three liters, four liters. If that's not enough, let's scoot to a simple face mask. Non-rebreather, right? We start working our way up to get their saturation right. We're trying to give the amount of oxygen, whatever amount of oxygen it takes to get them out of hypoxemia status, okay? If they're hypoxic, then we want to get them out of hypoxic status, okay? Because being hypoxic is very dangerous on the brain. So the leader flow is whatever the doctor said, put them on, okay? Now, the factors are E cylinder is 0.28, a G cylinder is 2.41, and the H cylinder is 3.14, okay? All right. What about the capacities? Even though the cylinders are different sizes, they still have the same amount of PSI in them. Then they may have more liters, but they still exert the same pressure. So an E-cylinder has about, it can, a full E-cylinder has about 616 liters of gas and it's pressing at about 2200 PSI. A G-cylinder has 5,308 liters of gas inside of it but it also pushes at a 2200 PSI, okay? And that's G is a uh, pounds per square inch. Uh, I forgot what a G is, but P you might see PSI or PSIG, same thing, okay? That's the same thing. And then H cylinder uh, holds 6,908 liters, but it still exerts a pressure of 2200 PSI. And that's all they're trying to show you right there, okay? Handling, we talked about keeping it in a carrier or stand. I showed you yesterday the uh, H cylinder should be on like a dolly-like stand. It has a chain wrapped around it and I have to make sure that I carry it and move it around properly. Keep it out of flames. Of course, it supports combustion. So not should be any smoking around an oxygen cylinder, okay? Uh, whenever we have somebody at home oxygen, we make sure they have no smoking signs. in the house and outside the house. So visitors don't come over smoking, all right? We went over and this is in the lab. So remember, make sure you go over the proper technique in attaching regulators, right? And then taking it off. Take the cap off the actual cylinder, crack it, cracking. Shh. One moment, make sure it blows all that stuff off of there. Place and tighten on the regulator. And I showed you the E-cylinder regulator, which is the pin index safety system. And I showed you the H cylinders regulator, which is the big ass, right? The ASS, American Standard Safety System, okay? Once you put it on and tighten it, you turn on the gas, which is the actual cylinder. Once that's on, you will see a pressure pop up on your Bordon gauge, right? The Bordon gauge is where you'll see the pressure pop up on. Once you see that, then you can turn on the flow of it to get whatever desired flow uh, that was either prescribed or what is needed, okay? Now, when you get done with it, you turn the gas off. You turn the gas off, and then you have to bleed that pressure out by either cutting the flow back on, letting it die out, or whatever, to bleed that pressure off, and then you can remove the regulator, okay? And make sure you put the cap back on whenever you're storing it, just in case if it falls, it doesn't turn into a missile on you. We said that cylinders are tested every five to 10 years. That's called hydrostatic testing. We just talked about that, All right? And we talked about the different types. You have the standard H and K size cylinders that are banked into a manifold system, which uh, that will have a, and we saw the H, I don't have a K cylinder here, but the H cylinder, right? Uh, and the K is a little bit bigger than the H one you saw, but sometimes you have those uh, bank together in a little manifold system. Uh, you have a primary bank and a reserve bank. The reserve bank automatically switches on uh, when primary system drops to a preset pressure. So if you say once once that primary get down to like a thousand or eight hundred, the reserves kick on. Then that's when you would call Next Air or whoever Pax Air to come and refill your cylinder. Okay. It's usually six or more cylinders manifolded together. Of course, they have alarms that are activated when they a malfunction happens or when they switch to the reserves. That's your standard uh, bulk system. And that's the standard bulk system, okay? 
which are those eight cylinders I showed you, there's about six of them that are manifolded together. You have a primary bank and a reserve bank. And when it, one get when the primary gets low, the reserve kicks in, sends out a warning or alarm to let you know, hey, something's going on, you need to refill this. Or if there's a malfunction, it will also let you know to come replace it. That's the standard. And then you have what's called fixed cylinders, which is a large bank of permanently fixed cylinders. These you can't just replace, right? They're, they're, they're bolted down to the ground, okay? And it can be up to 75 of those. And you refill them on site with a liquid O2 truck that converts the liquid into a gas to fill the tanks. That's a fixed cylinders. And it just depends on where you need this. Like the discussion that you're going to have talks about cylinders. Where have you seen some cylinders in use now that you've been learning about uh, medical gases and, uh, and the physics of gases and cylinders? Start thinking about where have I seen some cylinders? Like why they got cylinders in here? Or now I understand why they are using uh, argon or why they're using uh, oxygen in here or uh, liquid oxygen or nitrogen. What, what, why are they using it here? I used, I used to work at a laser plant uh, before I went to school and in the laser plant, they were cutting out stencils with a high powered laser, which was extremely hot, right? And it was, it was a laser, it had a computer program and the stencil that goes on the back of a circuit board, all those little uh, solder spots that you see, well, those spots uh, are placed there. Uh, they just kind of, it's hard to explain. They have a little program that we do, which gives an, a, a sketch, an uh, 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 Excel, the way you call them things. And uh, it cuts little bitty holes all over this sheet of metal, right, by the computer. The computer will put the program in and the laser will go and just make holes. It's a high powered hot laser. Once that's done, we would drip it down into this electrochemical bath solution, raise it up, put it on the table, look through a microscope and make, through, make sure that those sketching holes were perfectly sized. We would then wipe it down, epoxy the size as a frame and then send it off to uh, Apple or uh, LG or whoever, whoever was needing the, the solder line. And so what they would do is then take that plate, which is a etch a sketch, like little bitty holes, they would take that and put their green circuit board under it and put that on top and then take some solder and just wipe the solder across the top and it would be in those little holes. And that was how they start off with the circuit board. And they would take the circuit board and start hooking stuff to the solder, right? The transistors and the resistors and all of the chips and all that kind of stuff and slide it in your calculator or in your phone or in your computer and there you go, okay? But I never knew why they had big, large liquid O2 tanks in the back because it's so hot that kept the laser cool, okay? So that was like why, I and mean, it's nothing got to do with hospital, but it was very interesting because we used to play with that liquid oxygen uh, when we were on break because it would, you could turn the tank on and, and then turn it off and the liquid would drip into a styrofoam cup. And it was so cold that if you rolled it across the floor, it picked up the dirt across the the, uh, the warehouse floor. And then by the time it hit the other side, it went, bah, 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 bah. you could hear it hit the side, right? And it was just, this is liquid oxygen. But when it picks up the dirt, it turns it into like BBs. It's so cold, it makes things hard. And the table that we were using to make the hypoxy, to make it glue, was a heating table. So once we put the uh, stencil on the frame, we had to mix this hypoxy together and wipe it on there, put the frame on there and sit it on a heating table so it can adhere to each other. And once it was done, we take it out, put it in a box and send it to, like I said, the company. So of course, being uh, a boy, and uh, you know, I, I was a man, but still, you know how we do. Um, we, there were, it was a warehouse. We used to catch butterflies, I, I'm sorry to say, catch butterflies, drop them in the liquid oxygen, which, which turned them to statues, okay? If you take it out, it's like hard, like a table. The butterflies, completely hard, instantly, okay? And so then we, was, we were wondering, well, if we put them in here and then we put them on the heating table, will he come back to life and fly back off? So that's, you know, stupid stuff, but that's what we did. But I say that to say that cylinders, Right. That was a weird place for me to see cylinders. And in your discussion, I want you to tell me where have you noticed cylinders being used that are not necessarily the hospital might be a strange place. 
you know, you can go buy a massage parlor or something. They got a big tank in the back. Why, what would that be for, right? So that's what I want you to think when you use, uh, when you do your, um, your, your discussion for tomorrow, okay? So those fixed cylinders are large banks, about 75 of them outside. They're usually in a, within a fence where you can't get to it and the liquid truck will come and fill it up. That's a fixed cylinder. They don't, you can't move those. Then you have trailer units. These are something temporary, right? You got a large construction project going on. <clears throat> you got a large construction product going on and um, uh, you need some oxygen or you need some argon or you need some cyclopropane, whatever it is that you need. Uh, they have trailer units out there. It's a truck that would drive drop off the trailer full of liquid or full of gaseous oxygen, whatever it is. Uh, and when they're, when they're using it for cooling something or cooling down their saws or whatever they're using it for, they can call and say, hey, I need you to drop another trailer and pick this one up, pick up an empty. And they just come and hook to it and drive off. That is, or uh, those are trailer units. And they are what? 2,200 PSI, look at that. No matter how big the unit is, gaseous O2 pushes up to 2,200 PSI. Remember, we said the E cylinder is small, but it still has a, pound, a punch of 2,200 PSI. The H tank is big, but it still has only a punch of 2,200 PSI. So those trailer units of gaseous O2 are huge, you know, a tractor trailer, but it only punts 2,200 PSI, okay? <clears throat> All right. Then we got into the more definition of the liquid systems. Why liquid systems are so much better, right? And actually safer when it comes to the pressure, okay? Liquid systems are stored at negative 183 degrees Celsius or negative 297 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that is not the critical temperature. These temperatures that I'm showing you right here, this is not the critical temperature. This is the temperature at which I store it, okay? Remember that the critical temperature is negative 118 degrees Celsius or negative 181 Fahrenheit, and please don't forget the negative. It's not 118 Celsius, that will be hot. It is negative 118 Celsius and negative 181 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and some change, okay? But it won't be hard to see the difference, all right? So if I know that my critical temperature is that, then I'm not gonna store it right next to that temp. I'm gonna store it way lower, right? 183, that's about three degrees no, no, Celsius, that's like what? 118 and 183 was about 70 something degrees lower than the actual critical temperature. So I, that guarantees this liquid is not going to turn into gas on my watch, okay? Because I got it stored nice and cold, right? It's just like saying the critical temperature of that chicken in your refrigerator, okay? If it gets, if it gets above, what is it, Fahrenheit? If it gets above 20 degrees Fahrenheit, right, then you're going to have salmonella. And I don't know if that's the right temp. I'm just using an example. If they tell you that the chicken in your refrigerator right now, if you let the temperature of that chicken get above 20 degrees Fahrenheit, then you're going to have salmonella and maggots in that chicken. All right. Well, if you know that, you're not going to store that 20. You're not going to store that 19. You're going to store that bad boy at like zero degrees Fahrenheit, right? To make sure it does not get anywhere close to that critical temperature. So this is what this is. Liquid oxygen is stored at negative 183 Celsius or negative 297 Fahrenheit in a thermos-like bottle in a large container, large vessel. It has inner and outer steel shells separated by a vacuum. That keeps that stuff good and cold. All right, and then also not letting you stick your tongue on of it and stick your tongue on the on the side, right? You don't want to do that. So that actual cylinder outside is not cold to your touch. All right, because you were working around and you mess around, get your arm touched it, and now you stuck, right? That would happen if it wasn't a thermos type of container. Okay, just like your Yeti container. Uh, that Yeti, and I'm not uh, advertising Yeti, and just because I ain't made one yet. If I did, I'd have my name, right? Uh, but if I had one, that's what I would say. But the, for better lack of a better product, I will say Yeti, right? When you hold a Yeti, it's not necessarily, if you got cold liquid, it's not necessarily super cold in your hand, right? But when you drink it, it's cold. Or if you have some hot coffee in your Yeti container, it's not going to be super hot in your hand, right? It's going to be 
regular temperature, right? And when you drink it, it's still hot. So that's the way liquid O2 is, is uh, stored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope I'm still recording. All right. Now, far as how long liquid lasts is a little bit different. If I lose this internet connection, we'll log back in because it's starting to act a little funny. All right. As far as uh, how long liquid oxygen lasts, we use weight instead of pressure. Okay. Because liquid oxygen barely exerts any pressure. Look at that. In a whole large, huge cylinder that I showed you standing outside of a hospital, if it's full of liquid, it only exerts a pressure of what? 250 PSI. That's nothing, right? That's nothing. So I can't use that to see how, how long it's going to last because that's, that's nothing, right? But we do use weight to consider or to find out how long liquid oxygen lasts. We use the weight, okay? We use the weight. And so what you do is you take weight. Let me see, where is it at? Here it is right here, and I'll go back up. To find out how long liquid lasts, the liquid duration of flow, is the liquid O2 duration in minutes will be pounds of liquid O2 times 344. You always use 344, okay? You use pounds times 344 divided by the prescription amount of oxygen, which is in liters per minute. Okay, and that's what you're going to learn next about oxygen. And now, once we get this test out the way, we're going to talk about medical gas therapy. Right now, we're talking about the physics of gas. You need to understand how gas behaves, right? We need to understand how gas uh, is uh, um, uh, related to temperature, how gas is related to volume, how gas is related to pressure, right? You got to understand how gas behaves in order to understand how oxygen helps us, all right? That's why we don't get into oxygen therapy before we get into the gaseous physics, all right? So once you master gas physics, which is this one, and not just duration of flow, please don't just waste your time or all of your time studying. I got these formulas. It might be one formula on the test. The main crust of the lesson is the physics of the gas, okay? The qualities, how is it stored? What are the temperatures? How do they behave? How are they related to temperature? How are they related to pressure? Things like that, right? The gas laws, Gay-Lussac, Charles, Dalton, Boyle, right? Avogadro. Uh, those are the things you got to remember, right? I think even Henry's in there. So make sure you look at those and understand the behavior of gaseous physics, okay? That is what this is about. And yes, there'll be a bonus doing, being able to do these duration of flows, that's a bonus, but that's nothing, okay? And be prepared for at least two ABGs, okay? At least two ABGs on the test. Look out for the FIO2 to tell me whether this uh, oxygenation is corrected or uncorrected, right? Or overcorrected. That might be on there. But if they are in of their own room air, then it's just simply uh, normal oxemia or mild, moderate, severe hypoxemia, right? And we said, um, I think mild hypoxemia is 79 to 60, right? Seven, a P little a O2 of 79 to 60 is mild hypoxemia. The normal P little AO2, don't forget, is 80 to 100, okay? 80 to 100. If that's 80 to 100, it's normal, normal oxemia, not normal hypoxemia. That's a double negative. It's normal oxemia. If it is 79 to 60, it is mild hypoxemia, mild hypoxemia, which is deficiency of oxygen in arterial blood. Hypoxemia is deficiency of oxygen in arterial blood, right? All right. So if it's 79 to 60, it's mild. If it is 59 to 40, it is moderate hypoxemia. And then anything less than 40 is severe hypoxemia. Okay. 
Now, another thing I want to tell you, you may see as you go forward, dealing with ABGs, when something is compensated, another word for compensated or fully compensated, um, um, whatever it is, fully compensated, another word for that is called chronic, right? Because what do we say? It takes the kidneys about three days to adjust. So if you see in a respiratory acidosis that is fully compensated, that's been that way for a while. That's not nothing that's acute. If it's fully compensated, then that means that problem person has had that issue for a minute, okay? And the body has finally fixed it, right? To get the pH back into normal range. So when it's fully compensated, that means it is a chronic situation, right? Like say if your breath stinks, okay? If it stinks because of something you ate, then that's uncompensated. That's just acute, right? Uncompensated means acute, something that just happened all, just right quick, overnight, right? You ate something, now your breath stinks, right? But if you have a funky breath all the time, then that's a chronic situation, right? That's a chronic issue, right? You have compensated bad breath. That means you have had this bad breath for a while now, and they call that chronic, right? So just want to throw that in your mind. It's not going to be on this test, but I want you to always remember that fully compensated could also be called chronic because they might say he might have chronic respiratory, uh, chronic respiratory acidosis, right? That is compensated. That means compensated because it's been a while. He's been had this problem for a while. So another word for fully compensated would be chronic. And another word for uncompensated would be acute. Your body haven't had time to do anything yet, right? So if it ain't compensated, that third player is just sitting like this. I, he, he hasn't done anything. He's not, he don't care. He has not tried to change yet to fix the problem, right? And so that's considered to be uncompensated or an acute situation. If you take 15 Percocets, you're going to suffer from an acute respiratory acidosis, right? Because you're going to stop breathing or your breathing is going to get real low, real shallow. You're going to start building up CO2, which is going to be a buildup of acid. Your pH is going to bottom out, right? And your body going to be sitting there like this. Because you just, that's your dumb butt took them pills, right? It hasn't had time to even adjust, right? But after, after three days, the body will say, all right, let me increase so I can be a little more alkaline to fix this acidosis, right? And in that case, it would be chronic. But when it is an overdose or you got drunk or you got a stroke or whatever, sometimes a medical knocked you out or something happened and you stop breathing or your breathing slows down dramatically overnight, then that is a acute situation also known as uncompensated. All right. So you already know compensated and uncompensated. Just remember that when something is compensated, they may use the word acute. I mean, I'm sorry, if something, yeah, if something is uncompensated, they may use the word acute. If something is compensated, they may use the word chronic, because that means it's, it's been happening for a while, okay? All right, that was just a little side note. So that is how you find out how long liquid oxygen lasts. So if Mr. Johnson has 10 pounds of oxygen running at two liters per minute, then I do 10 times 344, equals 3440, right? Divided by two liters per minute, and that is 1720. So that is 1720 is 1720 minutes, right? If that's the case, I divide that by 60 to get my hours, and that is about 28 hours, okay? So if I, I could go farther than that. So 28 hours is more than a day, right? So you got about a day. Because I wouldn't say you got a day and a half. That's just two more two or uh, four more hours after a day. So I wouldn't say you got about a day and a half. You don't even have a half. So you would tell this patient, Mr. Smith, you got about a day left on that liquid oxygen. Okay. All right. The glory of recording. You can go back and look at it again, pause, whatever you need to do. All right. Now specifications for the bulk systems. The NFPA is who talks about these bulk systems. Uh, the NFPA, uh, they govern these bulk systems, right? piping zones in the hospital, right? Whenever we have piping zones in the hospital, those are uh, relegated by the NFPA, okay? The NFPA will talk about or make sure that 
that is what's being governed. Uh, and it's going to be handled by the fire chief. Okay. If there's a fire in the hospital, then uh, say you got a fire on, like, I think, um, um, Uh, if you have um, if you have um, if you had same friends, I think they got a, a floor called two berry or two sherry or something like that. If there's a fire on three sherry, then the fire chief is going to tell the respiratory therapist, you need to go to three sherry and turn off the valve, the zone valve, turn the oxygen off of the zone valve. Okay, and this is what I want to show you. See this. This is considered to be a zone valve. Now you wouldn't see these part. This is in the wall. This part right here will be in the wall. This part is what you can access. It'd be a little space in the wall, just like this, that you can access uh, to turn off those valves. Let me see if it's gonna show me the picture I want. All right, let me say this. Okay, valve. Desktop. All right, let's open up the valve picture. There we go. All right, so hopefully you can see this. Make sure you can see it. All right, this is an example of a zone valve, okay? The NFPA, National Fire Agency or something like that, uh, they are the ones that govern this, okay? You can notice by the colors, even if you couldn't read, look right here. This is green. See that green little mark right there? That lets you know that this is the line that controls the oxygen in this zone, okay? And on two sherry or three berry or uh, Turner Tower or wherever you are, that the problem is the Department of Fire Department chief is gonna say, hey, Charisma, you need to go and cut that um, oxygen off, right? Or Kenya, can you please go over to Three Berry and turn off the oxygen because oxygen supports combustion and you'll mess around and blow up that building over there if the fire gets if gets inside this copper, okay? So you would come over to Two Sherry and open up this little glass window. It's like a little glass window. You open it up plastic. You'll take your hand right here on this valve and turn it off. Right? See, all of them are open. They're over to the right, they're open. But when you pull it straight up and down, pull it over this way, it's gonna cut it off. Notice right here, you can't really see it, but this is another board iron gauge right here. It tells you the pressure inside of this line right here. So this is yellow, so what would this be? What line is this, if this is yellow? Since you can't really see it, yellow is what? Right. Medical gas, just medical air. It's room air. Yellow is room air. Green is oxygen. And what's white? What do we say white is? And then notice how white is going a different direction. See the arrow? The rest of them are going this way, this way. The white is going that way. But if we look at the word, it's the vacuum. There's a vacuum line that is a force, a negative force that constantly is, allows you to suction a patient. If I suction you, right? You cough up a loogie in your mouth. They have a little wand called a yanker, or we can use a suction catheter that will uh, actually go down into the trachea, right? We have a catheter, which you'll learn in 220, how to suction. You'll take the catheter and feed it all the way down into the trachea, right? And then suck that stuff out of there that the patient cannot cough up, okay? And so, but how's that going? How do you get it? You put your mouth on and suck it out like gas siphon? No. You have to have a vacuum line in the hospital. Now, their suction and secretions don't make it back to the line. It will be, there is a in-between spot. There's a bucket system that's in between the wall and the patient. So as the bucket system is sucking, then when you suck the secretions from the patient, they will dump into the container, a suction container, okay? They dump into the suction container, and then that way,
All right, that way you don't get any of that. You know, you know, that'd be terrible if it was their actual secretions going through the hospital. That'd be germs everywhere, right? All right, okay, so this is what's called a zone valve, all right? This is a zone valve. All right, go back to the lesson plan. All right, so the piping systems. Uh, locate the zone valves in the hospital. Do not turn off unless directed by the fire chief. Because if you turn the oxygen off, then nobody on that unit going to be getting oxygen. So before we do this, of course, we would have to bring tanks, right? If I got patients that are on oxygen 24-7, I can't just cut the valve off because chief said, turn it off, right? Fire Marshal Beal came in and said, turn that oxygen off, right? If I turn it off, then all my patients are now without oxygen in that unit, right? So I'd have to bring some, some larger cylinders, like eight cylinders, roll them up there and hook everybody up to those oxygen cylinders and then turn the valve off. Okay, because they cannot go without it. All right, still speaking about liquid, it's most economical because one cubic foot of liquid equals 860 cubic feet of gaseous O2, right? At ambient temperature, so that's like room temperature, right? At room temperature, one cubic foot of liquid gives me 860 cubic feet of gaseous O2. So if I got three cubic feet of liquid, I have three times 860, right? I got a lot of gas that I can make, right? Because that's what happens. It's stored as liquid and then it's heated up and transferred into gas to be pumped through the hospital, right? And so the hospital gonna need a lot, right? And we don't have enough gaseous tanks to pump in. So we use liquid, all right? So we would probably have a liquid system that would be like maybe 200 cubic feet. Right, so 200 times 860 is 172,000 cubic feet of gaseous O2, just by having 100 um, cubic feet, right? Or whatever I said. So that's why it's so economical. Look at number six, liquid O2 cylinders are used when usage is too large for cylinders, for gaseous cylinders, and not large enough for permanently installed liquid vessel okay they come in various sizes so whenever we, we have some liquid o2 cylinders not those big ones i'm talking about not the big ones that are outside the hospital but what if you have a company like i did what well, not i did but the company i worked for for the lasers that they didn't have enough work to need a liquid o2 bolted down to the ground outside like a hospital but they needed more than just a little e-sized liquid tank that over your shoulder for the job that they have. So in between, we can use liquid O2 cylinders. Like a, it was a large H tank bolted against the wall or chained up on the wall that we will had a line going from that to use on our laser machine. So we use that when, when, um, when the usage is too large for little cylinders, right? But not large enough for permanently installed like a hospital, right? Then we have what's called a fixed station, which are stand tanks. And they are large spherical containers. And this is what you see at the hospital, okay? This is what you will see outside of a hospital. They have a little section somewhere at the hospital that's usually, you can't really tell what that is over there. It's probably the liquid O2 tank. You gotta have enough space for the tractor trailer to be able to back in there and fill it up, he or she. Cause I've seen some female people working doing that too. So I never just say he, but he or she will fill up um, the stand tanks. Um, and it says, look, it says they're large and they have gases equivalents up to 130,000 cubic feet. So 130,000 cubic feet, how many uh, cubic feet of liquid would that be? If, if, if I can fill up a tank, a large fixed station, and I can make it be equivalent to 130,000 cubic feet of gaseous oxygen. Okay, well, how many cubic feet of liquid would I have to pour in there to equal 130,000 cubic feet? All right, I'll give you a minute to think of that. If you thought, if you got 151, you're right. So 151 cubic feet of liquid will equal 130,000 cubic feet of gaseous. See that? So if you're in business, you want to come and get 
I want you to bring me some liquid so I can make it stretch way out, right? I'm trying to, like, it's trying, like, trying to stretch out some dinner, right? I'm going to do whatever I can do to stretch that out as far as I can, right? Because I don't want to buy 130,000 cubic feet of, lick of oxygen. I don't want to buy that. I'd rather just buy the 151, which will turn into 130,000. Now, how did I get that? Well, we said one cubic foot of liquid equals 860 cubic feet of gaseous. So if I have 130,000 cubic feet of gaseous, I divide that by 860 and I get 151. Okay, so see how easy that 150 cubic feet, that's nothing, right? I can fill that up and last for forever. That's why it's more economical, okay? So the liquid O2 cylinders, we can use those when it's too, the job is not big enough for a fixed station, but too big for a little e-tank, right, of liquid. And then the fixed station ones are the ones you see at the hospital, outside of a hospital. And that's what supplies the piping system, right? That is piped into the hospital. All right, we just did this right here. Safety precautions for bulk O2. You gotta be safe. If you got, if you have a hospital that has a large uh, bulk O2 reservoirs, you gotta make sure you got 24 hour reserve uh, or backup supply. You can't, if the hospital can't simply say we out of oxygen, that just can't happen, right? I remember I went to Burger King not too long ago, maybe a couple months ago, and they had an order to tell me they were out of burger meat. How do you run out of burger meat at Burger King, right? That was ridiculous, but that happens, right? Poor management. So if you are not uh, ordering like you're supposed to or doing what you're not supposed to, things like this happen. You would never think a hospital would run out of oxygen, but if they don't have a nice, well-developed, 24-hour reserve or plan or procedure, then something's going to happen, right? That's going to be a problem. Right? That's going to be a problem. Now, so they have that. So if the system failure was like somebody came and ran into it, into a big truck and knocked over the liquid tank or some type of disaster, storm, lightning, something like that. Uh, happens and knocks over a system. Hello. Let me see how many have All right. So, yeah, make sure you, if a lightning strikes or something like that, you know, because things happen, storm, whatever. You got to have a procedure in place. Otherwise, you're going to be scrambling all through the hospital trying to find tanks to hook everybody back up. Somebody going to die and somebody going to get sued. All right, so now, oxygen concentrators. These are the machines that make oxygen themselves, okay? Oxygen concentrators are little machines that make oxygen themselves, okay? Little machine, because Mr. Smith can't be on, uh, uh, can't be on a tank all the time, right? He can't be on a tank or she can't be on a, a little oxygen tank all the time, right? And so they have to have something that's a machine at home that constantly makes oxygen, all right? They have little machines that constantly make oxygen that allow us to uh, deliver that oxygen to them without it being a problem, right? And then when the power goes out, of course, then we can um, put them on their tanks, okay? But when they're at home sitting in front of the TV, this is what they're using. It's called an oxygen concentrator. You see this right here? This is the flow meter where you would turn the flow up to two, three, four, five, whatever. Uh, this is a little place right here for a, a water bottle to be there. And then you can have your oxygen cannula coming off of that, right? There are many, many, many kinds, right? This is another kind. This is Invacare's kind, right? A little place for a water bottle. This spigot right here is where your nasal cannula will come off. It'll either come off and go into the water bottle and then from the water bottle to you or straight from here to you, depending on how much you own because oxygen and medical gas is very, very, very dry. All right, so the more you get, the more uh, humidification you will need or make your nose bleed and crack, all right? Uh, but like I said, there's several times. This, is, this also is a oxygen concentrator, right? They have some travel oxygen concentrator, they're portable, look at that one. If you're on a plane or whatever, you can have it and it's constantly making. This will be made by battery. So whatever they can do to keep from having to use tanks so much, this is another one, this is like a little digital one. 
So you see how it comes from the spigot to the water bottle? And then right here, you'll go from here to you. And that oxygen will go down in the water and pick up the moisture and then come to you so it's not so dry on your nose, okay? So these are oxygen concentrators, right? Oxygen concentrators. We even have liquid oxygen concentrators or liquid uh, liquid oxygen portables. Okay, let me show you that one. Liquid. First, I'll show you how um, show you how cold liquid oxygen is. Look at that. And you got it in a beaker. It's cold. Some beakers will like it won't. It'll bust through glass, but special glasses, special uh, cylinders, it won't bust. But that's blue. Look how pretty it is. Liquid oxygen is pretty and blue, right? And it said like liquid oxygen on a carpet, right? You can pour it on a carpet and turn it into stone almost. It's real, real, real cold. Okay, it's very, very cold. All right. Uh, this right here, this is not true. I, I never seen no liquid in where you could just drop it on something. That's, that's, that's crazy. All right, look at that. It's very, very cold pour it in the water and it turns into, uh, if you pour it in water, it starts to smoke. It'll start to give you white smoke. Cause that's another thing we did. Um, another thing we did was uh, take a water bottle like this and drink about half of it. And then pour some liquid oxygen in there and put the top on it real quick and get away and boom. Cause it will start to swell up the pressure, right? Cause the pressure is going up. All right, and that's probably another gas law. All right, so this is liquid oxygen. I'm trying to show you the liquid oxygen concentrator. Okay, here it is right here. This is what's called a liquid system. This is the liquid oxygen system here, right? You would have, the patient will have one of these in the house in the closet somewhere, and the guy with the truck, he'll come in with another one and fill this up or take yours out to the truck fill it up and bring it back in the house. So you'll have about 50 or 60 pounds of liquid oxygen in here. These right here will be the little portable shoulder oxygens that you will be carrying, right? And you can stick this on top up here and fill it up. So there's a way that you can sit this on top of here and it will fill up your little unit. And then you can put it on your shoulder and put your nasal cannula on it. And that's it. See how she's doing here? She's putting it on top. That's gonna fill up her helios or whatever that's called. This is the home unit, the big unit. She will put her oxygen on top of there, fill it up, and that's that on that, right? She will carry that one around. It will last way longer than a, a, a gaseous tank, okay? Way longer. See this one? This patient has a couple of them at home, right? Put to the side. So if something happens, the power goes out on the concentrator, they go to their liquid. So instead of them saying, uh, somebody called and say, how long do I have left on my system? There's a major blizzard, right? Knock that all my power down in uh, Buck Snoodle, Mississippi somewhere, where you are the restorative therapist that's on call, right? And you like that, I need me, I need you to come refill me now, right? Well, how many pounds you got left? I got 20 pounds left in that one. Oh, then, bro, you, you got plenty of time. Call us on regular business hours, okay? That's how you have to be, because I mean, you're not coming out in the middle of the night if they don't need you, all right? But this is another little picture of a family of uh, liquid oxygen systems, right? They're really, really cool. Really, really cool. All right, let's keep going. All right, now there are two types of concentrators. You got the membrane type and the molecular sieve. The membrane type is simply a thin membrane about one uh, micrometer thick, okay? Uh, Oxygen and water pass through the membrane. So when when it's when it's when it's turned on, it's sucking outside air into it. Okay, in the back, it's sucking it in. And it have the membrane type has a little thin membrane in there uh, that when oxygen, because you know it's oxygen outside, it's oxygen and nitrogen, right? Those are two major things outside the out air. The oxygen and nitrogen and water go in. Okay, it's sucking it in just like you are when you breathe. But with the membrane type concentrator, the oxygen and the water can pass through the membrane faster than the nitrogen, right? And so 
as the oxygen in the water get through, it sends that to you. And that delivers a FiO2 of about 40%. It can give you about 40% FiO2 um, through that way. So the nitrogen will go one way and the oxygen in the water will come straight to you. All right. And so that's really, really cool. Um, oh, and it just comes, you plug it up to the wall and it constantly does that 24 hours a day. And like I told you, you can make $500 a month renting out a concentrator. Because when people look at it, rather have a car, you rather have a concentrator, right? If you, if you need oxygen, you want to have a concentrator. Damn a car, right? So we used to make $500 a month on one concentrator, building the insurance, and then let that patient would be on oxygen for about a year, right? And if they finally die or get off, you usually don't get off of it. So once they own it on home use, they usually own it forever. So they're constantly being billed for. So one patient may have a concentrator for three, four years. That's five hundred dollars a month for three, four years, and they die. You take it. They call you. This person passed. Okay, we come get our stuff, clean it out, disinfect it, send it to the next person for another two, three years, right? So that one concentrator is possible to make millions off one. Now imagine you got thirty or forty concentrators out there in the field. That's why Lend Care and stuff like that making so much money because they, they supply tanks and concentrators, and that's a money maker, okay? A lot of, a lot of ability, but it's a money maker, all right? So the next one is called molecular C, which is a little bit better than the membrane. Two types of concentrators, membrane and molecular sieve, all right? The molecular sieve does this. It, it uses a sieve. It's like a little indention, like a little... Uh, gap or a ditch, right? It's a sieve. And you fill it with ammonium, uh, sodium ammonium silicate balls. It's little balls called a, a sodium aluminum silicate. Sodium aluminum silicate. Filled into this little trench, right? As the air is forced through that sieve, the nitrogen is scrubbed away from the air. And that leaves nothing but oxygen, right? And you can get about 90% at two liters per minute uh, of, the of the molecular sieve. So you can see that the better concentrator is the molecular sieve, con or sieve concentrator, okay? That's much better, right? But it's gonna cost more, right? It's gonna cost you a little bit more. All right. So that's what you're going to need. All right, let's go. Now, at higher flows, though, the FO2 will decrease. Now, you'll, you'll learn that as we get into medical gas or oxygen therapy. Uh, because it's just like I said, Kool-Aid in the water, right? The more water you get, the less concentration of Kool-Aid. Uh, also, think of this. If you're in the car and your boyfriend farts in the car and y'all driving, and he locked the windows, right? The... The, the FiO2 of the fart is strong, right? It's high concentration. But if I let the window down, I pull in outside air, and the more outside air that I entrain into the car will decrease the percentage of the fart, okay? It's the best way I can get you to understand that. When you get it, I know you're laughing, but you understand it. So as you get higher flow coming in, the FiO2 itself will drop. That's the concentration of oxygen, right? The fraction of inspired oxygen. That concentration or that fart percentage will go down if I let the windows down and let all that air come in and kind of bleed it down. But to say somebody farts in the car and the windows are already down, you barely smell it at first, right? Like, oh, what is that? Real light smell. But if he let the windows up on you, then that smell goes up even higher. So the lower the flow, the higher the FiO2 will be. The higher the flow, the lower the FiO2 will be, all right? And we'll get into that when we get into um, the gas therapy, okay? So those are the two type of concentrators. Last thing is regulators and flow meters. I showed you regulators yesterday, okay? But we're going to talk about some specifics about the regulator and the flow meter, okay? So today I'm going to introduce you to this flow meter. This is considered a flow meter. Remember the uh, the little dial on the end of a regulator. That's also a flow meter, okay? But this is a flow meter that you see that's a standalone flow meter, and it's called a Thorpe tube. This is a Thorpe tube, 
T H O R P E two it has the liters per minute on here. All right. It has a dial that turns, you can turn the liters per minute either way, like on or off. There's a little ball in here. See that ball? That's called the float. Right? As I turn it on, that ball will go up to whatever liters per minute I got it turned on. If I want two, I turn this on until it goes up to two. If I want 10, I turn it up until it goes to 10, okay? This is a flow meter. So let's talk about it. We said that regulators allow us to utilize the oxygen that's inside of the cylinder. The regulator is also already in the wall. A wall unit is also considered a regulator. Okay, so let me show you that. All right, share my screen. This here is a wall unit oxygen, right? This is the flow meter I just showed you. This right here is the Thorpe tube, but it hooks up to this wall right here. Inside this wall is the regulator. The pressure coming from behind that is coming from those zone valves, right? We talked about the zone valve. Those zone valves is what delivers the oxygen to this regulator. And you put your flow meter on top of the regulator to get the flow to use for your patient. Hello? A couple of them was up. Huh? I'm at work right now. I have to get you when I get out. Yeah. Uh, about, about another hour or so. All right. All right. All right. <clears throat> so this is considered a regulator, just like the one that's on that cylinder, right? That's also a regulator. All the regulator is, and there's some more pictures here, right? You got one that's the oxygen, and the yellow one is what? Air. The white one here is vacuum, remember? These are the same three you saw in that zone valve picture, right? This is this all regulators in the wall, right? They look like they come in different shapes and sizes, but they all are regular. Look at that. These are the regulators. These are regulators that are built into the wall. Okay. Now, what regulators do is bring that 2200 PSI down to a standard working pressure of what? I said that yesterday, 50 PSI. Now I can use it, right? Now I can use it. I can't use 2200. I can't hook up a nasal cannula to 2200 PSI. I'll blow your head off. I have to bring the pressure down from the wall or from the cylinder down to a nice working pressure of 50 PSI. And now I can do my therapy, okay? That's what regulators do, simple as that. Now, the regulator can do it either in one step or in more steps, okay? And that, de that depicts what type of regulator you have. The single stage regulator, right, reduces tank pressure to 50 PSI in one step. The single stage regulator reduces the standard working pressure down to once in one step. Michaelin, uh, I'm just recording today. You don't y'all y'all didn't have to log in today. So <laughs> So uh, the regulator that does its uh, reducing, right? Reducing that 2200 down to 50 uh, is in one step. That's a single stage regulator. It can do it all in one step, but some of them do it in more than one step. All right, so it's obvious. Uh, the single step or the single stage regulator does this by one pressure relief valve. All right, so what it is is it comes from the cylinder it passes through a pressure relief valve inside of the regulator and brings that standard working pressure down to 50 PSI, right? So if it's a single stage regulator, it has one pressure relief valve. 
if it is a triple stage regulator, it has what? Three pressure relief valves. Simple. If it's a double stage regulator, it has two pressure relief valves. That means it goes through one, brings it down a little bit, goes to another, and finally gets it down to 50. Okay? All right. Now let's look at the multi. That was the single stage. One step brings it to 50 and has one pressure relief valve. Say that about 200 PSI. So it um, comes from about 200 PSI down to 50. Okay. Number three, the multi stage regulator. That simply says it reduces the tank pressure to working pressure in two or more steps. All right. If it's a multi stage, it brings it down, it brings that 2200 down to 50 in two or more stages, right? But remember, each stage has its own pr pressure relief valve. So that's how you count it, okay? That's how you count it. How many, so it's a multi-stage, but, but, but more specific. If it has three pressure relief valves, it's a triple stage, it's a triple stage regulator. Now you guys are not looking at your emails uh, and your announcements, because I got people popping in. So let me pause again. All right, so the multi-stage regulator does it in two or more steps. Each step has its own pressure relief valve. It says the more stages, the less fluctuation of working pressure. Because if it's only uh, one stage, it's going to be 50 PSI, but it might fluctuate. It might go up a little bit more because it only has one pressure relief valve. But the more pressure release valves it has, the more accurate it's going to be. Okay, that's what they're saying. So that's either a single stage or multi-stage. If you want to know any more detail about the multi-stage, you count the pressure relief valves if you want to be specific, right? But if it's two or more, it's multi. Then you have what's called the preset regulator. The preset regulator is a single or multi-stage that is set to a pressure reduced to work, uh, is set to have pressure reduced to a set working pressure. Now that's usually 50 PSI. That's usually what they are. But what if you have working somewhere where they say, I want my standard working pressure to be 80 PSI? Well, then that's when you would have to use a preset regulator and you would set it to 80 before you hook it up. That's all they're saying. It's usually 50, but some places they want to change that. Okay. Uh, so, but once you have a, once you have the, the preset regulator, you can't change it after that. Once you set it to that working pressure, you can't change it, okay? All right. Then you have the adjustable regulator, and that's also a single or multi-stage in which the working pressure may be set variably. So that's a really expensive one, right? You can have one at single stage or multi, but you can set it on there and say, today I want to use 50 PSI, but tomorrow I want to use 100. The next day I want to use 75. Right, it can be changed whenever you want to. So uh, it's called adjustable, right? Now, these are not gonna be hard to distinguish on the test, okay? Uh, just, you need to know that they're either single stage or multi-stage, right? And to know how many stages it is partic particular, you count the pressure relief valves, okay? Each stage has a pressure relief valve. So I can count those if I want to know specific. Preset is set to whatever, whatever you got it set to and you can't change it and adjustable can be changed, okay? Now, we'll get into the flow meters. The flow meters are what I'm introducing you to today, which is the Thorpe tube, the Thorpe tube, okay? Make sure it's gonna have that board on here. Oh, there we go, okay, the Thorpe tube. Flow meters control and indicate the flow, not the pressure, right? Flow meters control the flow. If I turn this to two, it's going to be a flow of two liters per minute. If I turn this to three, three liters per minute. Four, four liters per minute. Back to one, one liter per minute, right? This is a flow meter that controls the flow, right? Don't forget on the other end of the regulator that I showed you had that little you see it in the video, but that's also a flow meter on the end of your regulator, all right? Which will control the flow, all right? But this particular uh, flow meter is called the Thorpe tube. This is the Thorpe tube. It is a vertical funnel-shaped tube with a float, right? 
See that little ball moving in there? That's the float. This is the vertical funnel shaped tube with a float. Now, one of the uh, one of the uh, disadvantages is this has to be standing straight up in order to be accurate. If I lay this down, then I don't know how much flow they're getting, right? The ball is moving. I don't, oh, oh, he on two liters. Oh, no, he on six. Oh, oh, no, he on 10, right? Depending on the elevator or whatever while I'm transporting a patient. Never use a Thorpe tube to transport. You will use the regulators I showed you yesterday, which was considered to be the board on gauge regulator. Because no matter which way you put that, it's going to show you the pressure that's still in there, right? So with the funnel type or the Thorpe tube, it has to be straight up and down for it to be accurate. If not, it's not going to be accurate. Now, what are the types of them? You got two types, compensated or not compensated. You have a compensated Thorpe tube flow meter or an uncompensated. This is not the same as the ABGs because it's not as hard as that. So don't even worry about it. Compensated Thorpe tube or non-compensated or uncompensated, right? This is what you need to know about the compensated Thorpe tube because they will try to trick you on the test about how they explain it. The compensated Thorpe tube or Thorpe tube flow meter, the needle valve is distal to the float. If I could put stars over that, I would. The needle valve is distal to the float. Okay, let me see if I got my, let's look at the, uh, PowerPoint right quick. See if they have a picture of that needle valve and float. All right, let me see here. Oh, the All right, let's look at this right quick. All right, so let me new share this one right quick. All right, this is a thought tube here, and it's showing you the difference between compensated and uncompensated. I told you that if it is a compensated thought tube, the needle valve is distal to the float. That means after the float. So look over here. This ball here is the float. This is the float. This right here is the needle valve. Look at this needle valve. Which one of these needle valves is distal to the float? Look at the arrow in which everything is going. Starting from here, going this way. Starting from here, going this way. Okay, good, B, B will be the one that is compensated because the needle valve is distal to the float. That means after the float. So going from left to right, the needle valve is after the float. So this will be considered to be a compensated Thorpe II. This one here, the needle valve is proximal to the float. So that means it is not compensated. Okay. It's another picture here of a regulator here, this wall regulator and the Thorpe tube here. 
right? You see over here, you got the air, and over here is your vacuum. All right, it's the boron gate. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is what I showed you the other day. Look at this one. This is the pressure, right? This is considered to be, this, this type of gauge here is considered to be a boron gauge. This is the boron gauge. When you turn the actual cylinder on, it's gonna read, gonna read a pressure. Look at this, it's right around 2200. In the green is considered full. This one over here is the flow meter, right? I will turn this knob here and it will control my two liters, three liters, four liters, five liters, six liters, whatever I've got them on, right? This is the controls the flow and this is the pressure, right? Now, if we look at this, what safety systems do we see? The first safety system is color. You see, this is a green cylinder, so it's an oxygen cylinder, right? And oxygen cylinders use the PISS, right? Pin index safety system. So we know oxygen is two and five, right? So this regulator will fit over those pinholes on the E cylinder, and then the, the yoke will turn and get it tight. It's the yoke and pin. The PISS uses the yoke and pin connection. Then we would turn the actual cylinder on and that's when our pressure will read, right? Boop, right to the pressure. Then we would turn on the flow that we want, okay? All right. All right. Now, being that it is a compensated thorp tube, the needle valve adjustment is distal, which means after or downstream, to the float. That means the indicated flow is accurate in the place uh, presence of back pressure. So what that means is, say I have um, this flow meter here, right? And I have my nasal cannula hooked to here to my nose. Well, if I kink the nasal cannula and close it where it's no longer coming to me, that ball, if this is a if it is a compensated thorp tube, the ball will start to drop. This saying it's accurate. It's telling, hey, he ain't getting no oxygen. I don't know what y'all doing, but the oxygen is not getting to him. All right, because either the hospital wheel of the bed, right, got rolled over my tubing, or I let the arm rest down and it pinched or occluded the oxygen tubing. Now the oxygen is not getting to me, and a compensated thorp tube will let you know, right? It's, it's accurate in the face of back pressure. So if it's sending oxygen to me and I kink it, that's back pressure going back to that. And it's gonna say, hey, something not right. The ball will start to drop, okay? When I undo the kink, the ball will go back to where it is. So it is accurate at all times. So I thought it was on six liters, but since it, was, it says two liters, well, it's supposed to be on six. Why is that? Because it's kinked, right? it is being occluded somewhere and it has dropped the pressure down. And so now it's letting you know it is accurate. It's telling you what he's really getting. You thought he was getting six, but he's only getting two because it is uh, kinked, because it is a compensated thought tube. That's what we want. Now in an uncompensated thought tube, if we have an uncompensated thought tube, then if I got him on six liters, and I turn the oxygen on, right? It's on six liters. And he takes it and he crumbles it up and kinks it. He's not getting any oxygen, but it'll still say six right here. And so that'll fool you. Like, well, he's saying on six liters, why he turning blue? He's turning blue because he's not getting it because the oxygen tubing is kinked up. But because you don't have a compensated thorp tube, you wouldn't know that, right? So you always check your patient from the patient back to the modality to see if there's a kink, a leak, a break, anything, right? You say, well, damn, he's turning blue. Let me look, it's, it's in his nose. Let me follow the line. Ooh, it's cut or it's kink. Let me undo that. That's how you have to assess in, the, in an emergency situation, okay? So an uncompensated thought tube would not be accurate in the presence of back pressure. It's gonna keep on riding and saying what you thought it was. If it's compensated, it will be accurate and it'll start dropping if there's a back pressure or kink involved, okay? All right. 
in order to know if it's compensated, because you're like, well, damn, I can't look inside of it and see what a needle valve is, right? Of course not. So there's some other things you can do to find out whether it's compensated. It'll either say it's labeled at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 50 PSI. Let me see if I can find it. You might not can see that. Let me see if I stop to share. Right there, it says 50 PSI. It says CAL, see that? Calibrated at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. See that? 70 Fahrenheit. So that lets me know, yeah, this is, this is, uh, compensated what is another way to know what if i what if that's been etched out and you can barely see it right another way to know if it's compensated is uh visualize the needle valve placement of course you can't do that it's not clear so we don't really know on that but then the last way to know is is to turn it all the way off and plug it into the wall okay when we plug it into that regulator on the wall right if the ball jumps up and falls down that's compensated, right? If we take this regulator and push it into the wall or screw it into the wall, which is the regulator, right? We take this flow meter, screw it into the regulator. The pressure that's already in that regulator, which is 50 PSI, right? When it when you start screwing it in, it's gonna, shh, it's gonna push pressure in here. If that ball jumps up and falls back down, then it is compensated. If the ball don't move, it's uncompensated, okay? So you need to know the ins and outs of that Thorpe tube, right? Whether it's compensated or not. The main thing is gonna say, the test question, I'm gonna tell you now, one of the test questions says, true or false, the compensated Thorpe tube flow meter, the needle valve is uh, proximal to the flow. That is not true. The needle valve is distal to the flow. But what if they ask you this? What if they say, is this true statement? The float is proximal to the needle valve. Yes, then that will be a true statement. That's just the opposite. I mean, it's just the opposite way of saying it, right? If I'm telling you that the, it, it look right here. If I'm telling you that, if I'm telling you that the calculator is distal to the float, right? If we're going from this way to this way. Well, the calculator comes after the float. This is the calculator, this is the pen. If I told you the calculator is distal to the pin, that will be true, right? That's a true statement. But what if I said the pin is proximal to the calculator? That's also true. Proximal means before. So the pin is before the calculator. So if we look at it like this, this is the uh, needle valve, this is the float. If I said the needle valve is distal to the float, that is a true statement. That is a compensated Thorpe tube. But I might also say the, the float is proximal to the needle valve. That also is true. It's just a word, word of words. You got to know your directional terms. All right? So they will try to trip you up on that. I'm telling you that now. They are going to try to trip you up on that question. All right? So that's the compensated Thorpe tube. Uncompensated, it's just the opposite, guys. The needle, the needle valve is proximal to the float. So that's when you have that needle valve that's way before the float, right? And I showed you that one uh, in the PowerPoint, all right? When that needle valve is distal, is proximal. So let's look at this one again. All right. Uh, Current slide. All right, look at this. We said that this is compensated on this side. The needle valve is distal to the float, which means after the float. Or if they say the float is proximal to the needle valve, that's true. The, the float comes before the needle valve. This is compensated. Uncompensated, the needle valve is proximal to the float. Now we have an uncompensated Thorpe tube. Or if we say the float is distal to the needle valve, that's uncompensated. So this is compensated, this is uncompensated. You have to practice those forms, those, uh, those terms. Make sure you practice your terms, okay? 
you got to know what proximal and distal is. All right, so let's keep on going. We're almost done. All right, so in that uncompensated, uh, we said the needle is proximal or upstream to the flow, and the flow meter reading will be lower than what is actually delivered to the patient in the presence of back pressure, okay? Won't be accurate. Then they have what's called a kinetic flow meter, which is not a Thorpe tube, but it's a kinetic. It has a plunger instead of a float. So the plunger is the same thing. It kind of looks like a Thorpe tube, but instead of a little float ball in there, there's a plunger. Like when you take medicine in a syringe, that little rubber, black rubber inside of a syringe, that's called a plunger, right? And so it works the same way, like you pull them cc's in a, in a syringe except for it's a plunger in there. So as a plunger rises, that's the higher lethal flow or a plunger, plunger goes down, that's less lethal flow. So instead of a ball, they use a little rubber plunger. That's called a kinetic flow meter. Everything else is the same as a Thorpe tube. It's just the difference between the float. Does it have a little ball in there? It has what's called a plunger, okay? It has a plunger in it. And you won't see that in the hospital. I think that's, that's pretty old. Pretty old. Matter of fact, I haven't seen one, I don't think, since I've been in respiratory. Let's see if I can see a quick. I think that's one there. Let me see if I see a better one. Yeah, I don't even see it. Yeah, I don't even see it on here. You you can look you can look and see if you can. This one here, guys, um, kind of looks like it. Hard to see, but look, you see that right there? See that float? That's like a plunger right there. Instead of a ball, it's not a ball. It's an actual uh, like uh, cylinder type of whatever that is. Uh, and it goes up two liters, right? Four liters, six liters, eight liters, and up there like that, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and this GPM and, and all of that, this is something used for something else, right? This is a water flow meter. This is for water, but this is a plunger, what I'm talking about. Uh, kind of looks like that as a plunger, but you'll never see uh, that in the field. All right, born on gauge. The board on gauge is simply, guys, the pressure manometer that's in there. When you see it, remember we turn on the tank and the regulator shows if it's full, right, uh, 2,200 PSI, 15 PSI, or whatever it is, that is the board on gauge, okay? That's the board on gauge. This is the board on gauge. See that? That measures the per pounds per square inch, PSI. See that PSI right there? PSI. This is the board on gauge here. Not the whole thing. The board on gauge is this part. This whole thing is a regulator that has a flow meter on this side, right? And it uses the board on gauge to read the pressure. Okay? All right. Now. This one happens to be a PISS because it has the yoke and the pin connections. It's green, so it is oxygen. But if I was colorblind, I wouldn't have to know that it fits only on oxygen because oxygen pin positions is two and five. See that? So this is a regulator. It brings the working pressure from the cylinder from 2200 PSI down to 50 PSI, okay? It utilizes a board on gauge. It's like a little, you'll see a board on gauge even on uh, your grill. If you like to grill, there's a little wound up uh, piece of metal with a little point on the end. And as it gets hotter, those wounds start to expand and that the, the meter goes up to tell you the temperature. Well, I cook out a lot, so I noticed that. Uh, but it's the same principle for your board on gauge, okay? It measure. what does it do? Please highlight this. Measures pressure, but reads flow. 
The boron gauge regulator will measure the pressure, which is right here. It measures the pressure and reads the flow. So is it two, four, six, three, whatever, two, I'm going backwards, okay? Right? This boron gauge regulator will measure the pressure, but read the flow. I can't say that um, as many times as it needs to be said. That is what you're gonna have to be able to know. That's a test question. Boron gauge will measure pressure, but reads flow. Measure pressure, but reads flow. Measures pressure, but reads flow. This is the one I want on my cylinder when I'm traveling, because look, no matter which way I turn it, the pressure gonna be the same. There's no float in there that's gonna move around. So if I'm transporting a patient, this is what I wanna use, the board on gauge. Let me use that one because I can turn this flow on and it's gonna show me my pressure there. I can roll on, okay? All right, still gotta monitor your patient though because if you get a kink somewhere, it's not gonna start changing nothing on here. You're gonna have to notice your patient, oxygen dropping or whatever. All right, flow delivered to the patient is less than flow shown on the gauge if back pressure is present, okay? They're showing you that he got 2,200 in there, but even if it's kinked, it's still gonna show 2,200. All right, so you, you gotta watch them, all right? You're gonna have to watch them. Even though it says 2,200 full, but it says the flow delivered to the patient gonna be less than the flow that's shown on the gauge if back pressure is present. So that means if it's kink, you know, he took it out and wrapped it around his finger and said, I, I, I want to die or whatever. It's blocked, but it's still not, it's still going to show 2200 or whatever is on there. It's not going to change. So you have to watch the patient, right? It works in any position. So no matter if they're traveling and they upside down, it's going to work. Okay. It works in any position. So when I travel, I want one of these and not one of these. I don't want to screw this onto a cylinder and be trying to use this. You always use the one with the board on gauge to travel. Now, the last part, yep, last part is using flow meters with helium. Ooh, we said helium now is a little bit lighter or more less dense than oxygen, correct? Well, since helium is less dense than oxygen, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful at telling you know, what, what we're trying to use because we use oxygen and helium called heliox. We use oxygen and helium in a mixture called heliox. And that helps lift the oxygen up over an obstruction because usually uh, oxygen is heavier than helium. All right, since oxygen is heavier than helium, if I have a tumor or a large airway obstruction, then I may have a problem oxygenating. So let's look at it. All right, so say I have, you got my trachea. All right, so say I have my right and left main stem bronchus, right? Well, what if I have a tumor in my left main stem bronchus? Right, this is a tumor. Well, that tumor may be so large that it is impeding my ability to ventilate, 
See that? I don't have much space to ventilate right there, do I? It's a big old tumor in there. So this is when we will use Heliox, which is oxygen mixed with helium. All right, and we have different percentages of that that we use. Uh, my blue. All right. So as I'm breathing in oxygen, right? I'm breathing in this oxygen. Let me pull this off. Now, this is my tumor, right? Let me say this is a tumor. I don't have much space for my oxygen to go. It, it'll start hitting this tumor and kind of backing up, right? Maybe very, very few will make it across. See that? Just very few of them. Now all this oxygen right here, but since this tumor is here, I only have a couple of oxygen molecules that's getting past that tumor. So how can I alleviate that? If I can't go in and take the tumor out, I can use what's called heliox. And now we mix oxygen and helium together. And the helium will lift the oxygen up because it is lighter or less dense than oxygen. So now we use this heliox mixture, which is now gonna be brown and blue, right? Because helium is in brown, and I'm using it for that. But now that helium will lift up that oxygen and get past that obstruction, right? And now I got a whole lot of oxygen making it to my parenchyma. Let me put the brown in there. See that? Now I have helium and oxygen mixture. See that? Got brown and blue. Gets over the obstruction, over the tumor, until I can get that tumor removed. That is why we use heliox mixtures. Now, we use heliox mixtures in different percentages, okay? The heliox mixture can be either a 80% to 20% solution, or it can be a 70% to 30% solution, depending on the severity of the obstruction, okay? Depending on how severe that obstruction is, we either use an 80-20 solution or a 70-30. And that is Heliox. Heliox, which is oxygen and helium. Don't forget, once we put oxygen with helium, now helium or that mixture supports what? Combustion. Alone, helium doesn't. But now that we done mixed it with oxygen, now it supports combustion. So the reason why I want you to know that is because the flow meter will read a little bit different using heliox because the flow meter doesn't, it doesn't have the same weight as oxygen, right? So the, the oxygen and the helium doesn't have the same weight as oxygen. So the flow meter don't know the difference. It doesn't know that, oh, this amount right here is helium, right? And that amount is oxygen. It doesn't know the difference. So you're gonna have some fluctuations in your flow. 
So let me look at the uh, thing right quick so I can tell you how much it changes and we'll be done. All right. Make sure, I hope you all seeing this. Oh yeah, you are. All right, so you got an 80% to 20%. The flow will be 1.8 times the meter reading. So for 80, 20%, let's see. Uh, for the 80 to 20 percent, the flow meter will be 1.8 times what you see. Okay, so if you see three liters, then you do three times 1.8, and that's actually the liters they're getting. Okay, if the heliox is a 70 percent to 30 percent, then it is, I think, 1.6. 1.6 times the flow meter reading. <clears throat> okay, don't make this harder than it is. <clears throat> this is for heliox. Okay, heliox mixtures. All right. So for instance, if I have somebody <clears throat> on a Heliox mixture and I'm looking at the flow meter, if the flow meter if the flow meter is hooked up to the wall, And let's just say this is two, four, six, eight, ten liters, right? If the flow meter is on the wall and they're getting a heliox mixture and the float says they are getting six liters per minute right if that's if they if it says they're getting six liters per minute then i know that let's say they are on a heliox mixture of 70 30. if they're on a 70 30 then what will the liter flow actually be they're on 70 30 mixture and the flow meter is reading six liters per minute but they're on a 70-30. So that means the flow actually that they're getting is 1.6 times this six liters, all right? So let me get my calculator. Six liters times 1.6, they're actually getting, they're actually, instead of six liters, they're actually getting 9.6 liters per minute. Okay, because it's a 70-30. What if it was an 80-20 mixture? What if it was an 80-20? 80-20 mixture, okay? Then, and I said they're on six liters. Well, I take that six times 1.8, and that's 10.8 liters. So they will be getting approximately 10.8 liters per minute. All right. So make sure you know that information about heliox. Okay, it's right there. Because you may get a question that says, uh, Mr. Smith came in with an obstruction in his larger airway, and the doctor or you decided, therapist decided to put him on a heliox mixture. The heliox mixture is an 80% to 20% solution or mixture, right? And the flow meter says he's on three liters per minute. What is his actual flow? You need to know how to do that, which is not hard. If it's an 80-20, is take that and multiply it by 1.8. If it's a 70-30, you take whatever it is and multiply it by 1.6, okay? All right, so. With that being said, guys, that is the end of gas physics. Uh, like I said, 
you've learned a lot. You need to make sure you do your reading and your homeworks. That chapter uh, in the workbook is going to help you understand a little bit better. Uh, make sure you get into the book and actually read that chapter on the cylinders. You may learn more than what you learned on lecture. Uh, but the, uh, today, that homework for tonight is already in there, due for two, four. And then tomorrow at one o'clock, you guys will be able to log in to your, uh, not, not Zoom, but go into Canvas and complete the discussion. Friday, you have a discussion that talks about the cylinders in strange places. You do 250 initial posts, 250 word initial post, and respond to two of your friends or your classmates in 50 words or more, all right? Don't forget, you also have that workbook. So you'll be working on that tonight and some tomorrow, whatever, but that's not due to tomorrow uh, at by 12. So tomorrow by 12 o'clock, that workbook needs to be turned in. You need to upload it and turn it in, all right? But uh, during the day, you'll be working on your, cause that's due by the time you come to class. For Friday itself, you need to be working on a discussion, okay? Friday itself will be the discussion. And on Monday, you guys will come in. We got the lab. I have the lab all set up. Please make sure you watch the videos because I got good videos on there for the lab. Uh, shouldn't be any question on how to do this. Oh, what is this? Uh, let me see. If you do that, that means you didn't watch it. There's no way you can watch it and then not know where you are. It is very specific, step by step. You're gonna do the E cylinder, the, uh, the eight cylinder, and then I may do a couple of duration of flows or how long will this last, and that's it. You don't have anything to do with liquid, none of that. So it's an easy lab. Do the test, do the lab, and you're gone, okay? Uh, but be sure you be dressed out in your lab. Be mindful of your fingernails and all of them piercings and stuff like that. Be dressed out stethoscope, all at lab coat. Bring all of that on Monday when you take your exam, okay? I'm trying to think, uh, yeah, so all the assignments are already set up for you, ready to go. Uh, yep, that's it, that's pretty much it. The videos, now we had issues with the internet yesterday, so it kept dropping, so I pieced in some things. I even load, uploaded an older, uh, gas physics lesson from the last term, which is the same information, uh, but you take what you can get out of that, it might, you might be overkill. You might have too much information, but either way it go, you've got enough, okay? You've got enough plus what your responsibility is was to be here or be live and do the reading and the work. You should have no problem with this exam, all right? This should be an easy uh, comeback. If you not didn't do what you wanted to do or you don't feel like you were you're supposed to be, this will be a good little comeback. Uh, there will be at least two ABGs on this test, so don't forget about those. They're going to be on every test going forward. Every test going forward, you will have ABGs. All right, so don't let those ABG questions be the reason why you failed that test. I was going to pass, but I missed them two ABGs, and that gave me a 70, right? Let that be two that are for the good, all right? I appreciate the students that came for uh, tutoring today talked about ABGs and they felt a little more confident. Tutors on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 a.m. on Zoom, okay? So see you guys on Monday. Do not log in tomorrow, right? Come Monday, right? You don't come to campus until Monday, all right? Take, be ready to take your exam, do your lab, and then Tuesday we're going to get started with medical gas therapy. Have a good day.